Father, once again, we, we come before your throne with a humble request that you will somehow get through to us tonight again. That you will soften our hearts, open up our minds, help us to be receptive to your words so that this joy can be passed on to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to imagine the greatest disappointment you've ever experienced. Right now, picture in your mind the greatest time that you've been disappointed. And then, increase it several times more. Think of how great you've been disappointed, and then try to imagine how it would be if it was even ten times that bad. There's several uh, events in history that have been labeled disappointments, even a great disappointments. But I don't think any of them really could compare to what the disciples must have felt that Friday. Try to put yourself in their situation. Leading up to Jesus' death on the cross, they were, became more convinced than ever before that Jesus was Messiah. Leading up to that time, they were convinced He was the one who would save them. Yet the impossible happened. Something more horrible than they could have ever imagined, their Savior died. But the, the cause that they were living for, the cause that they were fighting for, the cause that they had become their own seemed to end. And, and it didn't matter how often Jesus tried to tell them that he would die. It didn't matter all the prophecies that they knew that the Messiah had to die. It was something they still didn't expect. They knew, as we know, that everyone eventually dies. That's a fact we all know, right? Everybody eventually dies. And, and even though death always hurts, it's most painful when somebody dies before we expect. In their minds, Jesus was just starting his ministry. He'd only been actively in ministry for three and a half years. Besides, he was just now getting the recognition and attention they thought he deserved. People from all over were starting to believe in him. In fact, when he entered Jerusalem just a couple days earlier, they welcomed him as a king. I mean, they, they never, in their, never in all their life would they have expected this to have happened within a couple of days' time. Now all that was gone. All he had worked for was over. You see, we have to understand that at the beginning, the cross was not a symbol of power. To the disciples, the cross was a symbol of the end. It was the end of Jesus' life, the end of their ministries, the end of their hopes. They couldn't see past the cross. Seeing their Savior, their teacher, their best friend hanging on the cross had to be devastating. Sure, Jesus could heal the sick and even raise the dead, but how could he do that when he was dead? In their minds, all was lost. And it was in this moment of defeat that they forgot. It's in the moment of great trial that we forget some of the promises of God, friends. I don't know if you've noticed that. Those are the times we're supposed to remember the promises, but that seems to be the times we forget the promises, huh? All that he had taught them was pushed far from their memories. If they had remembered, if they had remembered what Jesus said many, many times before, they would have not been discouraged, but instead they would have been encouraging people that they would see Jesus again. If they had remembered. If they had remembered what Jesus had taught them just, just even moments before, the day earlier, they would have been preaching the power of the resurrection in the streets of Jerusalem the very next day. I mean, they had just experienced Lazarus being raised from the dead, didn't they? About a week before, that's what they experienced. But they weren't doing that. Instead, they were huddled in a secret room, afraid that they, his followers, would be next. All the promises of God were thrown out the window when they saw their God seemingly defeated. But their forgetfulness at this moment was very understandable. Their whole world came crashing down. Their belief system was demolished. They weren't able to think clearly. We never can in those situations. And that Friday afternoon, they could only watch through tear-blurred vision as the religious leadership, with help from the Romans, murdered their God. The next day, according to John, was supposed to be a high Sabbath. It was supposed to be a very special day. It was a, a regular weekly Sabbath that fell upon a Sabbath of the, of the, the Feast of, of Passover. It was supposed to be an extremely special day for them, but for them it wasn't. It was a day of sorrow. That was the day when everything started to actually hit them when they woke up the next morning and Jesus wasn't anywhere around. As the day passed on and they, all of those memories from the day before just kept coming back to their minds, it would be a day of great sadness, confusion, and growing fear. Jesus and their mind was gone once and for all. 
It's interesting, though, that there, there were some that remembered Jesus' promises. It wasn't who we expect, though. The Bible says that the chief priests and the Pharisees remembered what Jesus said. They remembered He said He would rise again in three days. And they said, oh boy, He was preaching that all the time. What if, to make it happen, the disciples go and steal the body? So we need to make sure that that can't happen. So they go to Pilate and they share these concerns and they suggest that the tomb should be secured so the disciples couldn't do that and claim Jesus had risen. So what does Pilate do? He grants them a guard of soldiers and tells them, you have my permission, make it as secure as you can. So it was not Rome that secured the grave. It was the leadership that secured it. They were going to make sure that Jesus was done once and for all. So they secured it. They, they sealed the tomb, and they put a big guard of soldiers around it. No disciple would steal Jesus' body that night. Little did they know that very early Sunday morning, a memorial would be established that would bring more joy than anybody could imagine. Where the cross was going to reveal God's love like no one had ever seen before, that morning people would see the power of God like they hadn't seen before. That morning, as the women made their way to the tomb, you can imagine, uh, they, they had to anoint um, Jesus' body with the traditional burial spices. This was something that they did in those days, but they didn't do it they, the day before. According to uh, Luke chapter 23, the very last verse, verse 56, it says that they, they didn't do it because they rested according to the commandment. They rested on the Sabbath. So they were going out there the first time that they could, very early Sunday morning, and they were going to go out there and give him the proper burial that he deserved. I can imagine them walking quietly together as they walked down the path towards where Jesus was buried. They needed to do it, but it was only going to bring back painful memories. No matter what they thought they were going to see when they arrived, they weren't expecting what they actually saw. I can guarantee you that, friends. They were expecting to see, the, you know, in, in those days they wrapped a body in burial clothes and they were expecting to go in there and see a body wrapped in burial clothes. They were expecting to go there and, and see the stone still there. They were expecting to see the guards and have to talk their way through it. But what they actually saw was a, the stone rolled away and the tomb was empty. It's interesting though, the Bible doesn't say that they immediately rejoiced. They didn't rejoice. They didn't turn around and have a quick praise service. In fact, the Bible says that they were perplexed about it. Now, a lot of times when we think of perplexion, we think of just confusion. And the idea of the word has that. It, it, they were at a loss of what happened, but the original Greek carries with it the implications of serious anxiety. When they saw the stone rolled away in the empty tomb, they became scared, friends. Because it still didn't hit them that Jesus was alive. Their first fears were what the Pharisees had thought was going to happen as well, that somebody had come and stolen the body. Of course, what would you expect? If you're going to go to visit a loved one at the grave and found an empty grave and an empty casket, you wouldn't say, hallelujah, they're alive. You'd go, what? Who did this? Right? They hadn't experienced this. They weren't expecting that. Especially when they thought the one with the power was in the grave. How could he come out? He was dead. And while they were trying to figure out what happened, you've got to praise God for this, because God realizes that sometimes we get confused, and He sends people, He sends angels sometimes to comfort us. They needed to be comforted because they weren't excited, they were scared, and so all of a sudden, two people, two, two uh, men, it says, with very uh, shiny clothes, dazzling clothes, appear before them. Now, if you were scared already... If you were already scared in a cemetery and two glowing guys show up in front of you, you'd be terrified. Amen? And the Bible says they were terrified. They fell to their knees. Their knees gave away. They, they, they just got really weak. But these were angels. And the angel says, don't be afraid. The one you're looking for, he's not here. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Angels have a weird way of asking questions, don't they? <laughs> they told the, woman, the women that Jesus wasn't here because he had risen just as he said he would. You see, sometimes we forget about those promises. 
Jesus had told them over and over and over that he was going to die, but that he would rise again on the third day. And suddenly things started to make sense to the women. As they returned to the city, Jesus' words, all those teachings started coming back to their minds. And they remembered him saying it this time and him saying it this time. And, and you know who was among those ladies? Mary, right? And Mary was one that was there present when Jesus rose Lazarus. So she knew what Jesus had taught that day. So they quickly go back and they tell the next people who they figure want to hear this. And they go tell the disciples. And as soon as they explained it, the room broke out with praise and thanksgiving, right? Nope. No, in fact, the Bible says the disciples thought it was nonsense. I don't know if you've ever lost a loved one. If you lost someone that was really close to you. But when you lose something that's really close to you, you want more than anything else for the next couple of days for someone to say, oh, we were wrong. They weren't actually dead. Here they are. They're alive. Isn't that true? I know after my, my father died when I was nine, I remember all the time thinking that this was all just some kind of a big prank. A bad one, you know. You're on candid camera. This is not a good candid camera one. But I always thought that, that, that there was maybe some hope that, that it was going to turn around and say, your dad actually didn't die. He was just really sick and here he is. He's back for you. Of course, I saw my dad in the casket. I saw him dead. And I saw them bury the casket, so I knew any time those times I thought I saw him in the crowd or I thought that there might be a chance, I knew it couldn't be because I saw him die. I saw him dead. And the disciples, they're hearing this, and the, the ladies are coming back saying, he, he's, he's risen, he's risen. And they're like, come on, we all wish it too. But stop speaking the nonsense. It's just a hope that we have, but it's not reality because that stuff doesn't happen. Peter and John, though, the Bible says, couldn't resist. <laughs> Something about what the lady said got through to them. Depends on which gospel you read. The gospel of Luke said only Peter ran, but John says, I ran too. <laughs> says they both ran to the tomb. And guess what they found? The tomb was empty. Just as the women had said. Now, I'm not sure we could begin to understand what was going through their minds. Because at this moment, when Peter and John, they go there and they see this grave, they see that the grave is empty. There's got to be a flood of emotions going through their, their hearts. A, a glimmer of hope and a moment of fear. I mean, how would you react if you went and, and, and had that same experience? If you went to a loved one's tomb and you saw it empty, do you think you would believe it if someone told you that one of your loved ones who had passed away was not alive? So I doubt it. Yet, there they stood, inside an empty grave. Now, here's the thing that added confusion to the whole, th the whole thing. Is if it was really grave robbers, they would have stolen the, the stuff that was in, the, stone, in, the, in, the, in the, the grave, not the body. And if they had, they would have stolen the body, grave clothes and all, right? Yeah, well, the Bible says that when they went in there, they found the grave clothes nicely folded. Yeah, Jesus even makes his bed when he first gets up. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It says the cloth that was over his face was folded neatly in a separate pile. Jesus, when he, when he rose from the grave, he didn't just get up and go. He actually made everything up. They walked in there and they see grave clothes folded neatly. That can't be a robbery, friends. And then the completely unbelievable happened. They go back into Jerusalem and they're trying to explain what they saw too and everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. It's hard to believe. What could they believe? And then Jesus appears. It might be one of those things where they blink their eyes and they rub to wonder if they're just imagining what they see. But no, it is really Jesus. He's really there. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what they must have felt? having thought that all was gone, all was lost, and now they see their Savior standing in front of them again. But he doesn't seem to look the same because the Bible says he was risen with glorified body. We don't even know what that means. But it means he didn't show up all bloodied and bruised and he looked different. Yet there was no denying it was Jesus. There was no doubt. It was definitely Jesus standing before, him, before them. He had already appeared to Peter and Mary and the disciples on the road to Emmaus. He even made a special appearance later for Thomas. 
Thomas wasn't there at that time, and he says, well, I'd love to believe you guys, but unless I see it, and Jesus shows up to him and said, now you see it. And he says, some people maybe won't believe unless they see it. And believe me, everybody's going to believe it when they see him. But he says, blessed is the one who believes before they see. You see, there's another time when people are going to see the risen Savior, friends, and everybody's going to see him. The Bible says that all, every eye will see him. And at that point, everybody's going to realize he's risen Savior. But if you didn't believe it before you saw it, it's too late. So blessed are the ones who believe it now. Praise the Lord. I'm sure that day tears of sorrow were replaced with tears of joy. If the cross revealed sacrifice and pain, the empty tomb revealed joy and victory. The cross took away their hopes, but seeing, seeing Jesus brought back that hope a thousand times greater. But Jesus told them it was going to happen. In John 16, he told them, So also you will have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. You see, he said, you're going to be sorrowful when you find out what it costs for your salvation. When you see me die on the cross, it's going to break your heart like you can't imagine. But when you see me risen, it's going to put a joy in your heart that no one's going to be able to take away. And you know it's true, friends. Because the disciple, that you couldn't stop the disciples from preaching Jesus risen from the grave. It filled their lives with joy that was uncomparable. Incom now all the words of Jesus came back to their minds with great power. What he said in John eleven twenty five, 25, right before he raised Lazarus, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in him, though, I, though he shall die, yet shall he live. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus says. If anyone will believe in me, even if you die, yes, you will live again. Jesus did something by rising from the grave. He started the resurrection. You see, the disciples knew about the future resurrection. We know this. Martha talked about it, remember? When Jesus says, you're going to see your brother again, he, and she says, yes, I know, in the resurrection on that last day. They knew that. They knew that that was coming. They probably knew the prophecy. Isaiah 26, 19. This is a beautiful prophecy. Isaiah 26, 19 says, Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light, and the earth shall give birth to the dead. Way, way back then in the, in the, in the times of, of Isaiah, God was already saying, get ready and look forward to, rejoice in the fact that there's going to be a resurrection. They had hope already. But see, before Jesus, that's all it was. It was just hope. Hope is an interesting thing. You can hope in something. You hope it's going to happen. Is it going to rain? Well, I hope so. Is it going to stop raining? Well, I hope so, you know? And when you say, I hope so, when you hope it, you're saying you would like it to happen, but you're not sure if it will, right? So we can say, well, I hope there's a resurrection. I have hope in the resurrection. But yet there's still sometimes something in our minds that say, yeah, but is it really possible? I mean, this is what they thought back then. They knew the resurrection. They, they knew it was a teaching in the Bible, but they had never experienced a resurrection before. Not like this. They saw Lazarus come from the grave. That should have been enough. But that day, when Jesus, seeing Jesus risen from the dead, they experienced the truth of the resurrection. Now the resurrection was not simply a hope for them. It was a reality. Because now the one with the power to raise people, had defeated death forever. They experienced the power firsthand. Jesus standing there in front of them after such a grueling first few days removed any doubt that He was a Son of God. Believe me, if they had any question in their minds that He was Messiah, that was gone when He showed up again. They knew. It proved absolutely nothing, not even death, was impossible for God. The power of the resurrection would also now serve to empower the people. Look what it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. The power of the resurrection would be applied to our lives already. Some people think that when Jesus rose from the grave, it just gives us hope for the future. But friends, Jesus' resurrection from the grave gives you hope for the present. Notice what it says here in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. And this is just one of the passages that says this. 
It says in verse 4, We were buried therefore with him by baptism unto death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Do you understand what he's saying there? Because Jesus, because of the power of the resurrection, because Jesus was raised from the grave, it now gives us the power to be able to live in the life that God always wanted us to live. Remember we talked about that before, where God is our creator, he's our recreator, right? You know, what gave the, you know what supplies the power now for us, that recreation? It is Jesus at the cross. The power of the resurrection. Now it says that we might now walk in the newness of life. That same power that raised Jesus from the grave is the same power that lives in our lives today. It's the same power that will make us victorious in life. Of course, Christ raising from the dead was only the beginning. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. It says this, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, what's the first fruit, friends? Well, by definition, Christ is, but I mean, just in general, the idea of a first fruit, what is it? It's the first fruits. That's, when you use the word in the definition, I think in, the, in education they say that you can't do that. It's the first of a harvest, right? It's the first, uh, the, the first part of the harvest that guarantees that the, you're going to be able to have more after that. The very fix, first apple that you pick from the tree that's ripe is the first fruit. It's the one that tells you that there's going to be a whole tree full of apples you're going to be able to harvest later. So Jesus rising from the grave, as Paul says, was the first fruits. It says he is the example of all the resurrection that's going to happen later. Praise the Lord. There's going to be a harvest, friends. God is going to come and he's going to raise people from their graves. We can have faith and hope in that now. It's a reality now for us. He was the first of all who would be resurrection. And it gets better than that. Because if we read on, verse 21, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. There was one act a long time ago that caused the fall of mankind, that made sin enter this world. And ever since that decision, death has been part of our lives. But because of Jesus rising from the grave, friends, death no longer has to be a part of our life. It can be a pause in our life, but we can be now guaranteed eternal life. See, he paid the price at the cross, but he was conqueror with the open grave. Christ conquered death and the grave. No longer would death be able to hold anyone who trusts in Him. So when we see a loved one now die, it's not just hoping in the resurrection. We can know that we're going to see them again. We can know it, friends. That's what faith is, right? This is one of those memorials that we must not forget. This should be the story that's constantly on our lips. Jesus is risen from the dead. You know, this is one of the things that amazes me. In Christianity, and I don't want to pick on anybody or any, anything specifically, but a lot of times we, we adore the cross, but we forget about the open grave. You know, I see people with, with a cross, they're wearing a cross or they have a cross on the wall. When's the last time you saw an open grave? Like a symbol for that. Because that's a sign of victory for us, isn't it? Now, of course, what you need is, if you will, Both. Because if, if he didn't die, he couldn't rise again. But if he died and he didn't rise again, it's still not powerful. You need both of those. Actually, you need the whole thing. Jesus being born in the flesh, living a perfect life, dying the death that we deserve, and rising to conquer death and grave. You need all of that to give us hope. But the power of the resurrection now reveals to us that there's nothing impossible for God. Nothing. Jesus himself says in Revelation that he holds the keys to death in the grave. Now, when you hold the keys to something, 
That's pretty important, isn't it? I mean, when somebody does something really great, they give them the key to the city. I don't even know what that does. I mean, maybe back in the, a long time ago when there was like a wall around the city, it was the key to the gate, but now you get a key and it doesn't open anything that I know of. Unless they give you like a master key that opens every house, that'd be scary, wouldn't it? <laughs> you get the master key of your work or of your... That means people trust you. That means you have the ability to let people in and out. Jesus, friends, has the keys to death and the grave. Which means if he, if, if he wants to let somebody out, he can let somebody out. Praise the Lord. Because of Jesus, His victory, we can look forward to the reality of what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. This is one of those passages, again, that's, this is one to put to memory. This is a, a beautiful passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter four and starting in verse fourteen. Because of his victory in the cross in, in the open grave, because he rose from the dead, we have this hope. It says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You see, friends, this is something we should be sharing. This is a message of hope that we should be spreading because it's something that will remind us about the power of our God, the one that we serve. We don't serve some great teacher who died long ago. I remember when I got to go and visit... In, in Israel, I got in trouble. I, got, I get in trouble everywhere I go. But anyway, the, the, they were taking us through the, to the place, uh, the garden. Um, well, basically, it's the garden that they believe that Jesus was buried at. They found a tomb there, and uh, it's empty. And it looks like it was carved out a little longer than the original person was intended to be. And so they said, this is where the, the tomb of Jesus was. And, and I was standing outside. It was, it was a neat to see a, a tomb that was there, and they had a place for the rock. But... The, the, uh, um, the guide noticed that I didn't seem very interested and said, well, you know, how come, how come you're not as excited as everybody else? And I said, well, but I don't, I don't necessarily believe that this is Jesus' tomb. He said, well, why do you say that? And I said, well, because he's risen. Any empty tomb pe- could be his. <laughs> I mean, we could go around and find any empty tomb, and it could be Jesus's. See, I'm not there to, to visit the tomb of a Savior that or once walked through this earth. I go and I serve a Savior that's risen. There's no tomb to visit. There's no memorial to visit, is there? No, because Jesus, when he died, rose again. We serve a risen Savior. Jesus is alive and well, praise the Lord. That gives us a different hope. Because the teachings he taught were not just good teachings, they're power-filled teachings. When he promised something, that means they're gonna, it's going to come true. So when he says that these last days he's going to uh, begin the resurrection and all men will be raised because of his power, because of the victory he had in grave, we can bank on it. We can know that he's going to raise the dead. Praise God we serve a risen Savior. You see, seeing our loved ones again is no longer only a hope, it's a reality. Eternal life is no longer simply a hope, it's a reality. Power in this life and life eternal can be ours because our Savior lives. As that song says, because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds the future and life is worth living just because He lives. Friends, don't forget you serve a risen Savior. He's alive. And the power that raised Him from the grave, that power can help you transform to who you're supposed to be. And that power will make it possible for you to rise when Jesus comes. 
Let us praise the Lord for that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this hope. Thank you for these promises. We thank you for the victory, not just the victory at the cross, but the victory over the grave. Because when we see those two combined, it's the most powerful thing that ever has happened on this earth. We see your love demonstrated in a mighty way. And we see your power demonstrated in a mighty way. And we know that that tells us that all that we're doing, all the trials that we're going through right now, the, the tough times when it seems like the whole world's against us, against us because we want to follow you, it's all worth it. Because when you say you're coming again, when you say you're going to raise the dead again, when you say you have the power to change our lives, we know it's true. Father, let us not forget that our Savior lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.